Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is September 12, 2024, and it's a meeting of the uh, Cross-Sector Mitigation Committee of the Vermont Climate Council. We have a quorum present, and we can begin. Are any announcements right here at the beginning that anybody would like to make? Okay. Uh, we need to assign a note taker for this meeting. And uh, Dave, you put your hand up. That's great. Thanks very much. Uh, and we should take a look at and approve the minutes of our last meeting, uh, August 8th. Any amendments, refinements to those minutes requested? All right, then we will deem those minutes to be approved. Um, in terms of the agenda today, the first half of the meeting is, and maybe more, will be principally be addressed to the uh, hearing updates from the our committee's task groups. And I know that, you know, quite a number of you have been hard at work, and I really appreciate that. The um, And then the, uh, there will be an opportunity for public comment and um, a discussion of public engagement, which I believe the Climate Action Office will lead us through, and a discussion of cross-cutting pathways and how the Climate Action Office will help the committee with that. And anything else for the agenda, Jared? Sorry to, to go backwards. I didn't want to hold us up on the minutes while I was looking for it, but um, I may be the only one. I may be missing something, but I don't see the minutes posted with the meeting materials or linked to in the agenda. So I don't actually know what minutes we would be approving. I think we have to wait on that unless I'm missing minutes that other people have read. The, I presumed that they were posted with the August 8 meeting. It doesn't. Not not from what I'm seeing on the ANR okay. council page. If they're not there, then we shouldn't <laughs> we shouldn't ask people to vote on them. I apologize. I had read them previously and since I was the note taker, I was prepared to accept them. But the hey, I was the note taker, just FYI. Oh, you were the note taker <laughs> yes. of, of the uh, August 8th? But I sent them to you and uh, Melissa, I think, immediately after, if I remember correctly. So okay. we yeah, did so have confusion I, with the minutes. I do see them posted on the calendar with our August 8th meeting, but they should have been linked in this month's agenda, which they were not. So apologies for that. Oh, so we need to go back to the August 8th meeting. If you, if you go to the calendar, they are posted. But again, sorry for the confusion. Do we want to take a quick minute now to review? I just added to the chat and I can link it to the, the website for today. Thanks, Liz. Yep. What does that mean in terms of public meeting? If was the notice, the official no notice, um, what's on the calendar or what's on, the public has to have access to that it's just maybe I'm getting too much in the weeds I, here. I think it's fine. I think it's been typical that the meeting minutes of the meeting itself is where they've been posted. So I believe okay. if people want to review it quickly and we want to say it's okay or make changes, that's totally fine. Um, I'm good with them. Nice job on the minutes, Rich. Or Liz. And Rich, Rich on the previous ones. Yeah, I had I I was I was July. I was I was mixing up my months. So 
Liz yeah. isn't listed on there, just right as attending. But. So let me know if people would like a little more time. It is your name, Rich, at the bottom of the August 8th minutes. Yeah, Just... and Liz is enlisted as attending, so. <laughs> All right, I'm. <laughs> Just remember typing everything up and sending it off. It's, yeah, it says submitted by, so maybe. <laughs> Can we deem them approved or are people still looking? Two corrections, yeah. Okay. So, um... We will deem them approved. And let me ask Liz Amler uh, to, or whoever does this, to put a cross link in the agenda for future meetings that link back to the, the place on the web where the prior meetings minutes are posted. So- Yeah, I'll share that with Brian. Yeah, okay. You're right. It would be Brian that that, that would have done that. Um, thank you very much. The minutes now are uh, deemed to be approved. Anything further about the agenda? All right. Thank you. With well, let's let's. Uh, dive into the test group updates, beginning with transportation, because last time we we gave a short shrift to the transportation working group, we've concentrated on thermal. So this time we take transportation first. Okay, I will take a stab and start and then lead in lean into some of my other colleagues on the transportation task group, Gina and Andrea. Um, but the transportation task group is not as far along as we would like to be, but we've met several times recently and have started, you know, obviously baselining, looking back at the recommendations that were in the adopted climate action plan, and then considering, you know, potential new recommendations and modifications to existing recommendations. I mean, just as underscoring for all of us, I think people are well aware um, there's still a big gap in the transportation um, section in general um, through the, you know, when TCIP sort of fell apart. And we've been working since then to figure out what's the primary regulatory or policy tool. There is a study underway, and I'm going to ask Andrea to speak to that briefly in a few minutes, if that's okay, because that's such a huge component of um, <clears throat> some of the core things that we need to, um, like what one of the core things that we need to identify to ensure that we're making progress in the transportation sector. That is true in general. Um, that is also true with um, recent news that unfortunately um, the Agency of Natural Resources application for the Carbon Pollution Reduction Grant Program was not supported. So about half of those dollars, I believe, of the almost, I think, just over $99 million application were intended to support transportation programs, including core programs like electric vehicle incentive programs, mileage smart, etc. I raise that in the context of this conversation because those programs are looking at running out of funds, I believe, by the end of this calendar year. So, some of the core programs that we've identified in the climate action plan and that we want to continue to lean into and not just maintain but expand um, are at a very at a tenuous moment. Um, so that has implications. We've discussed some of those things. Um, we've also been in the process of just making sure that we're doing our due diligence to understand what is the landscape. We have heard from VTRANS and other state staff on 
status of the EV incentive programs. We're going to be hearing more about that at our next meeting, um, ideally next week, um, to learn more about that, including learning about the progress, the challenges, and the opportunities with multifamily um, electric vehicle charging. Um, so that will be big and important in terms of making sure that the electrification opportunity is available to everyone. Um, and we also have been hearing about the <clears throat> the study that VTrans undertook looking at how to quantify the benefits of reducing vehicle miles traveled. There was a study um, that came out. We need to be looking into that study further um, and leaning into it in terms of the recommendations that we want to build out for reducing um, you know, VMT through by, by providing Vermonters opportunities to get out of their car to get where they need to go. Um, so I'm going to stay pretty high level because that's largely where we are. And I'm going to talk about the sort of first two pathways briefly and then turn it over to Gina and Andrea to talk about the third pathway, which is the VMT, Vehicle Miles Travel Pathway. Um, what we did do is sort of shrunk two existing pathways that were in the initial climate action plan into one, which is all about vehicles. So they it was separated into light duty and heavy duty in the initial Adopted Climate Action Plan, our view is we need to sort of just look at strategies that reduce greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles broadly. Um, and some of those core programs that we identified in the Adopted Climate Action Plan are going to continue forward, I believe, at, per our recommendation for consideration by you all and then the Climate Council, which is just, you know, <clears throat> main, continuing to, um, you know, adopt you know, California's advanced clean car rules um, and stay um, sort of in the mix of following California's lead in more advanced vehicle um, efficiency and electrification measures and programs. Um, and so we've, we've sort of leaned into and are looking into those existing recommendations and then also have started to identify other potential new actions, which again, we are grounding ourselves in the research we need to do to understand what is already happening, what is practical, possible, and beneficial. Then of course, we're gonna go through the, you know, sift all these recommendations through the rubric and the equity um, just transitions lens. Um, some of those things we are looking at include things like, you know, needing incentives to fund medium heavy duty electric beat um, programs, looking at things like a potential super user incentive. Are there ways to target if we can find a funding source for EV incentive programs that is sustainable? Um, are there ways to target those um, incentives to support those folks who need to drive more than others to get into cleaner electric vehicles to really maximize um, economic value and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, um, and then lastly, because I'm throwing a lot at you, happy to talk more and really invite people's ideas, looking into potential managed charging or new electric vehicle registration information. Dave Farnsworth has laid an idea on the table. We're exploring that, looking at um, potential time of use, rate participation, um, engaging customers. And this is something we really want to talk about with the electric um, sector <clears throat> subcommittee, um, Liz and company. Are there things that we can be doing in the sort of time of use space? Um, and then really trying to grapple with like, what is a long-term sustainable funding source? There are two, two studies underway. I'm going to ask Andrea to give a brief overview of both of those, one looking at funding for the transportation system broadly as we move to more efficient and electric vehicles, moving away from the gas tax, which is not durable and sustainable over time, and what other funding mechanisms we have to invest in our existing infrastructure um, writ large for the transportation system, and then also this um, cap and invest low carbon fuel standard um, analysis that's underway to support our ability to help identify or recommend a potential preferred um, regulatory or policy pathway or pathways for the transportation sector. 
Um, and then <clears throat> anyway, we're grappling with a lot, a lot and also really leaning into the expertise of VTrans based upon the fact that the Supreme Court may have or may likely or a potential new administration might ratchet back on um, sort of the ability for California to maintain its clean car, clean cars waiver, which the advanced clean cars program, advanced clean cars two, and the advanced mm. clean cars program are premised upon. So there are some issues in flux and really trying to grapple with, is there a sort of um, proactive way to recognize that this is a tenuous moment and what can we be doing as a state if something like that happens? So those um, are the, that's pretty high level overview of the sort of two big pathways that we've identified. Again, one being the reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, from vehicles and the other big pathway um, being just sort of lowering the carbon intensity of fuels. Um, what did I miss? Anyone else on the task group or should I punt it over to Gina and then ideally Andrea to talk about the two studies and anything else I might've missed or mischaracterized. I mean, I would just say you, you said we're not as far along as we'd like to be, but I, I thought we have, we're, I think we're doing very well. Joey. Oh, good. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to consider. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I really do think our last meeting was super productive and we're on a good path, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of things going on for sure. Gina and I met this morning on pathway three, so I'll let her talk to that and then I can jump in and provide a little bit more context of those other things. Okay. I, I just want to, before I start on, on pathway three, I want to emphasize this funding issue. Um, you know, we're making assumptions about that there will be money or there won't be money. And that, that situation is very dynamic and that's got to be identified in this section of the plan and, and probably elsewhere along with these um, federal and state policy shifts. So um, I don't know how the council is going to grapple with it. It's certainly mm -hmm. relevant here and maybe just the cro cross sector has got to grapple with it. But I think that's super important because we can write down all kinds of stuff. And if there's no funding or especially for the near term initiatives, then what's the what's the point? Um, yeah, or we can, we, Gina and I talked a little bit about this this morning too, about just being broad about funding, like fund these programs um, isn't really necessarily actionable <laughs> because those come with a lot of um, issues um, and maybe try to make those actions more related to what is available and what is going on. Like we talked about um, the electric sector seems to be making good use of the IRA. And I think transportation could be doing more in the state for helping people take advantage of that, people and entities. So um, I think those kinds of more, you know, actionable items that will have a potential to come to fruition is the direction that we need to go. So instead of just saying, fund this, fund that, fund, 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 you know, not gonna happen. In addition to funding, it's setting up some kind of prioritization system for the various um, strategies. And the prioritization will be first and foremost based on em emissions reductions, known emissions reductions from those strategies to the, the, the amount of emissions reduction. So we've got to set, we, and everything's not equal, I guess is, is the point here. And I suppose others are grappling with that same thing too. But anyway. Since we are talking about funding, I can just jump in and there's not a lot to say about the funding study. Um, Patrick is leading that. Um, we have a consultant on board and we are, you know, mandated through the T-bill to, um, to look at funding options for sustainable funding. Uh, so especially given, you know, <laughs> as we electrify, we have less revenues. So um, it's to look at the gamut of options for that. And we have um, a really good consultant on board, CDM Smith, and they are, uh, we're just jumping in. Uh, so we have internal kickoff meetings and that's that's all we have going on right now, but um, do need to do a report 
um, I, I don't remember the exact date, but it's the beginning of the legislative session. So um, that's a lot to uh, take on and we're sort of benchmarking and seeing what other states are doing, what's effective and what could be effective for, um, you know, the particular scenarios of Vermont. So that's really just getting underway. It's that's a really important issue and it's going on in every state and federally too, because yeah. as we become more efficient, we have less revenues and less revenues for things like transit, bike pad, and not just roads and bridges. So, right. And there will be coordination. Between, happen. It's been yeah. talked about for decades. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have certainly asked um, and expect that the consultant will be coordinating with the consultant for the transportation policy um, initiative too, because obviously those both have the, you know, revenue, that other one has the, revenue potential. So um, they'll be coordinating on those efforts too. Liz has her hands up. Hand up. That might have just answered my question. I was wondering whether the study you were talking about was the one that will recommend alternatives to the kind of temporary BEV and uh, plug-in hybrid uh, fee that goes into effect January 1st or whether that was separate, but it sounds like they're coordinated. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, the mileage-based user fee is, yeah. yeah, that is beginning to happen. Um, and then the study will continue to look at that and, and the gamut of other options that are available. Um, Patrick could speak a lot more to that. If we want more detail on that, I can ask him to come to this subcommittee meeting and talk about that, especially as we start to dig in. Um, but yeah, and then and then also the the transportation policy for greenhouse gas emissions reductions and the cap and invest potential to um, have generation from that as well. So, and that, I don't know how much detail you want on that study. Um, of course, we'll be coming to the cross-sector mitigation subcommittee to provide presentations as the work progresses and we get into the analysis. Um, we're just sort of setting it up still. Uh, we'll have, a public meeting the first week. I think we just determined um, to save the date for um, October 3rd is going to be our first public meeting on that. And it's going to be really a general overview of what cap and invest is, not getting into the weeds of the analysis. Um, and then following up the week or two after that, we'll start digging into our stakeholder meetings. Um, so, uh, yeah, that'll be the second and third week in October. We're just nailing down who those stakeholders are going to be, but it's going to be, um, you know, obligated entities, impacted entities, EJA, environmental justice um, and equity. And then um, the, the fourth group is the environmental contingency that we want to hear from. So, um yeah, and then the technical analysis, we're just kind of meeting with other entities that have these programs in place and um, doing that sort of benchmarking and figuring out where it is. It's a little difficult because New York doesn't have a program yet um, and WCI's, um, there a lot of their variables are moving around too. So uh, it's a little hard to, to dig into the analysis on that, but our consultant is proposing different methodologies to do that. And so the, the real technical analysis is just about to kick off. Dave. Dave? Uh, thank you. Um, I apologize, Andrea, I wasn't quite clear. We're, you've just gotten a, a consultant to do a funding study and you've just discussed the elements of a funding study or that study and a separate study. We have two, two separate studies from the T-bill, yeah. So it's a funding study, and then there's a GHG policy study. Thank you. Yep. Do we want to jump into pathway three reduction in yeah? Vehicle? So why don't why don't you do that, Gina, and then we'll take general discussion and questions. We're taking up our time. <laughs> taking up the whole time here. Um, so we're going to get into some real transportation speak here. But reducing VMT means uh, reducing energy use by reducing trip length or replacing more energy intensive modes with modes that have no or lesser energy demand 
than a single occupancy vehicle. So that means the the most the least energy intensive. I mean, you do have to eat, but walking and biking is that is the ideal. And then ride sharing, transit, inner city bus, and inner city rail are these other these other goals. Um, so how do we how do we identify and plan for and identify and fund the proper VMT uh, strategies to get us the best bang for the buck? So that. Uh, in our view, is to um, improve and increase uh, transportation planning and thus informing funding priorities for emission reductions. And that's got to happen at the state, regional, and municipal levels. It also mm -hmm. means coordinating with land use planning, um, energy planning, transit planning between uh, municipalities and then up and down. Um, and then setting VMT reduction targets and complying with federal greenhouse gas emissions and other performance metrics that might be going on out there at, at the state level. So we have this planning that is really critical to get people's voices and land use into the conversation. But then uh, there's just this idea of state mode investment, which is informed by planning, but then VTrans is going to be making decisions and the, the carbon reduction strategy that they completed last year, and that Andrew can talk about a lot more than I, um, identifies what the ben what the emissions benefits are from those various federal programs that fund um, bike pad or transit. And to what extent that study should inform mode investment um, needs to be identified. Now, the understanding is that this mode investment isn't just about emissions reductions. Increasing transit is critical to increasing quality of life for, ma for many people. Bike pad has health components to it. So it may be that the emissions benefits are great, but the council or somebody's going to have to reckon with, and the public has been so clear in wanting more of these modes. We have to reckon with how we're going to to present that if in fact we've determined there's not a lot of emissions benefits. The um, second strategy is to, uh, and this is uh, the smart growth strategy, it's to acknowledge the direct connection between land use and transportation demand. Now, we don't have a lot of specifics here yet. There was a study that was done by VTrans in ACCD, right, Andrea, or was it just VTrans? It was VTrans, yeah, but ACCD was part of it. Yep. Didn't understand what those benefits of concentrated mixed-use development are going to have on um, on emissions, and we need to really dig into that, which we haven't done yet, and take from that what recommendations belong in the in the um, in our plan. We need to talk to ACD. I mean, the challenge is that smart growth is so important for so many reasons, and we don't want to turn this plan into a smart growth plan. And where do we put it in the plan, in, in our plan? Because it affects everything. It affects Act 250 now and resilience and all these other things. So that's something we dealt with this the last time, and we're going to have to dealt with it, deal with it again. Thankfully, we have the study that does show us that there will be some quantify some benefits of concentrated mixed use development. Liz? Yeah, I was just gonna flag for the last agenda item today, we'll be talking about the um, memo that Liz and we put together on um, the cross committee benefit, uh, cross committee areas, not cross sector. Um, and one of the ones from the prior plan was compact settlement. Uh, we did have some conversation at the steering committee just in approving that the memo come to you know all of these committees um, about whether compact settlement as a kind of overview uh, really is the right way of looking at it or whether it should be somehow broadened just given, because uh, you're absolutely right, there's mitigation impacts and effects and benefits to it, but there's also resiliency potential, um, potential impacts the other way, right? So, and especially with our uh, experience in Vermont since the last plan went into effect, 
um, there was some discussion at the steering committee. I, you know, I raised it among others. So just for full disclosure, whether that compact settlement uh, topic needed to be broadened. So anyway, to your point, it should be discussed. Um, it may need to be broadened and it's definitely not just uh, your task group or you know subgroup or even just our committee, right? Um, it's a bigger conversation about where that fits given the potentially conflicting uh, issues that it raises. Yep. Yeah, and in in what programs, policy, and funding are uh, should are relevant to this plan that promotes smart growth? You know, I'm not. It's it's. I'm I'm not sure that I look forward to talking to ACCD and others who are more directly every day involved in those programs, the regional planning commissions, um, to figure out what we should be putting in in the transportation sector of, section of the of the climate plan or the climate plan writ large. So, Andrea, have, have I missed anything? Nope, I think that covers everything. Are there questions, any, any more questions? I have a couple of questions, but I'll let others go if they have questions. So it's it, so here, two challenging questions. Yep. Um, a number of policies that have been included in the transportation elements and could be included in transportation elements require funding in order, as a, you have said here, uh, require funding in order for them to actually be successful in reducing emissions. And the so the question is, I, I mean, I think it would, I forget who said it, but one of the three of you said, we, we don't want to just say, hey, we should have these programs and they should be funded. And then somehow assume that we're going to be able to achieve emission reductions uh, and because they're included in the plan that way. The question is, do you anticipate including recommendations for how they should be funded? Or, it, and if not, you know, then what's the point? You, you wanna go ahead with that, Joey, or do you want me to? I mean, yeah, I'll take a stab. But I think what we've talked about is certainly we're thinking that a the study that's looking at low carbon fuel standard cap and invest programs, if there's a recommendation there, which I anticipate there will be, um, based on everything we know across the planet, um, that would be a you know a revenue raiser. Um, so that's sort of core. Clearly, we know that um, you know state budgets, community budgets are strained at the moment. You know, there's there may be an opportunity to sort of flex or repurpose existing transportation dollars. Um, but you know, I think what we have identified is that we really need one or more policy and regulatory tools that would not only reduce emissions but do so by raising revenues to invest in the very strategies that we know we need people to uptake, um, you know, both for cutting carbon, but also for public health outcomes, economic benefits, equity, you know, goals, all of the critical um, priorities we have. So it's not a tidy way to answer your question, but I think that that's how we're looking at it is we need one or more of those programs to help raise the revenue for a sustainable funding source. I mean, the two uh -huh. major areas, in my view, that that need funding, we know, are the purchase incentives and the charging infrastructure. Those are two areas that we, last time around, they're very clear they're going to have benefits, and we got to do them. We got to shake all the pillowcases and turn over the sofa cushions to find the money. We made some assumptions last time. I think the way we go into this is we look at those programs, we list what's possible and obviously the the cap and trade is is a known way to to raise money um you know to to what extent 
we're able to recommend, it's it's a snapshot. You know, we're going to have a snapshot of what's available today. We don't know what's coming down the road. Also, there's the state level and there's the municipal level. And also there's public-private partnerships that could produce, particularly around charging infrastructure, that might be a way to, to do it. Um, I mean, Andrea and her staff know way more than I do about what the federal possibilities are, particularly around charging, if there's anything else out there that we're missing um, in DEC too. So I, to answer your question, I don't think we're going to say, oh yeah, it's this, this, and this in the plan. I think we can give a snapshot of what's available today from the very most known to something that could be less defined. What about fee baits for new vehicle purchases? That's still sort of on the existing sort of set of recommendations. We haven't grappled with if there would be a modification to that. You know, if it's still on the table, we haven't tackled that. But it is still one of those programs that could potentially, you know, help fill some gaps. I mean, the work hasn't been done to define that, Rich, how it, how it would work in Vermont, whether it be net revenue neutral or not, um, how it, it relates to um, EV incentives or not. I think, you know, I think it's very uh, worth looking into, but it, the, the details have not been fleshed out on that. I appreciate the question though. It's a really important point we're grappling with. Everyone, but he's, you know, expert, you know, input, anyone's thoughts, deeply appreciated. The only other thing I would mention when it comes to funding is we have ident talked about this climate action plan update comes at the very same time when the Inflation Reduction Act is out there as a tool and a program to help individuals make investments in the very things that, you know, so leaning into the federal programs, whether it's IRA and direct pay programs, you know, we want to be exploring that so we can leverage this moment in time to reduce um, upfront costs, reduce any potential programmatic costs, that sort of thing. That's across the board. And I hope across the board through this sure. subcommittee in general, we're all thinking about any kind of recommendations or an Uber recommendation or approach to maximizing um, this window of opportunity. Yeah, I think that's where we can provide some specificity and we should. Okay, anything further on transportation? Next up, thermal. Oh, oh electricity. Thought... We'll take a short report from electricity, Liz. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought this was the perfect setup for me, so I'll, I'll go next. And the reason it's a perfect setup and uh, is because I feel like last time we had a deep thermal, this time we had a deep transportation, and once again, our electric will be pretty slim because uh, various vacation and other schedules uh, in August. We did get together uh, and divide up work. I think I had reported that last time. Uh, we got together further to make sure we knew who was drafting, you know, updates to which pathways. Uh, and then we stalled out basically because of various vacation schedules. And so we have been exchanging, uh, you know, the need to get together and finish up work in September, but we don't have a uh, new work product to share today. Um, just as a reminder of the three pathways that were previously in the climate action plan, for the electric sector. We know we will be refining and focusing on two of them and, and whether that then expands to become an additional pathway because of that work is still TBD. But um, the actual mitigation with regard to purchasing decisions, uh, we believe largely will have been covered um, and recognize that we need to describe how it's covered by the new res that the legislature put in place this last year and that is rolling out in the coming years in terms of the new uh, requirements. The other two pathways, just broadly speaking, focused on um, ways consumers and customers can help uh, increase uh, the benefits of electrification and therefore mitigation for Vermont um, by making choices to fuel switch uh, with regard to thermal, as well as 
uh, manage and help with load control for, for their devices in their home, um, potentially also, of course, generation at the home level um, paired with batteries. And then the other pathway was more focused on uh, the utility and other um, uh, external company players that can help with managing uh, the grid as a whole and making sure that that grid is you know, well-maintained and ready to support electrification for Vermonters. So it's those two aspects that we're focusing on uh, as a group. And there are some new areas of focus that come about because of uh, the passage of years and the improvement of technology and deployment within the state specifically storage, which of course was mentioned in the last plan, but not a specific focus. Um, we have you know, more information now and, and further work both by utilities and others on programs that can be described and we can discuss how those can be expanded. So we anticipate storage to be more of a focus this time than last. And in addition, on the load control and management side, um, the how best to partner with customers to achieve that. You had mentioned in the transportation uh, discussion, time of use rates and you know rate design certainly has come up in our discussions. Rich has men mentioned it and we plan to you know, make sure that that is covered. Um, and I just put on the table, as I'm sure you've all heard me say before, um, I think many of the utilities, I know Green Mountain Power certainly, but I believe the other utilities as well, really view that as kind of a two-track approach where there should be offerings for customers, of course, for time of use, but that a very successful track that has worked well in Vermont so far and that we anticipate should expand going forward is um, management by utilities or even if there are third-party aggregators permitted to work with utilities. Um, so that customers don't have to make those, you know, sometimes complicated decisions all on their own. Um, and in the EV space, there are um, PUC proceedings that have taken place on rates that are already in effect, as well as asking utilities to expand and include additional rates. Um, so if the transportation group wants a citation to that recent last year docket, I'd be happy to give that to you. Um, so that you can include that thinking and also to help arrange if needed, having the utilities uh, chat with all of you or even this, I think we had talked about pot potentially having them chat with this uh, committee as a whole to give some updates on the types of consumer facing and also utility management programs um, that are either in existence or in contemplation that could help with the mitigation side of the equation while also you know, having co-benefits with resiliency in other areas. So anyway, the short version is more work to come. Um, I anticipate that at our next meeting, I'm hoping, looking at Rich, because I know he will help participate in this, uh, we can have our group be the kind of lead presenter with more information, just as we've had the other two, the last two meetings. Thanks, Liz. Questions? I think there's, uh, thank you, Liz. I, um, all promising. Um, there's an additional cross connection point to be made here. I think that has that goes to the resilience aspects of grid enhancement, and that's something that rural resilience might want to comment on or might want to ask us to comment on. I'm not quite sure how which way they want to go with that, but I know that utilities are have this. Uh, at, you know, front and center in their thinking. So it's not like we have to beat the drum on it, but we might want to make reference to it. 100%, that's right. We've focused more on mitigation, but obviously it's all incredibly interconnected. And that gets to that topic for later in the agenda about uh, the cross cutting pathways or however it's denominated and whether we take an opportunity to either uh, change or broaden uh, the pathways there, um, not just compact settlement, but really um, resilient infrastructure, just period, across the state in you know various sectors, including uh, the energy sector and utilities. Yeah. Any anything further questions for Liz? I th I think one question that we need to consider with respect to both transportation and electricity and the cross connect is how are we going to pay for um, 
charge vehicle charging stations and opportunities you know do we have and maybe andrea you can answer this question you know do we have a statewide plan for that would detail what's needed and do we have an understanding of what's already in the pipeline or what is expected to be supported by funding existing streams of funding so that's like starting at the top going to the well, what do we have in hand what's left what's the gap and can we as part of the climate plan make a recommendation for how much of that should be paid for through the transportation budget and how much if any should be paid for through uh, uh charges on electricity and i suppose the third thing that, that gina mentioned is how much of it can we expect to be paid for with a public private partnership there may be other options i haven't mentioned but i it's a gap as I understand it, that we haven't yet decided what we would recommend to public decision makers to solve. Yeah. Um, is there like a statewide plan written down? No, <laughs> uh, for EVSE, but we are in coordination um, bi-weekly, all different state agencies coordinating on um, the deployment. And we have state funds that ACCD is administering. We have federal funds that we are administering. We're just really ramping up on our um, IIJA EVSC deployment with um, contracts going out in the next month. So really, we haven't seen those funds go into play yet, um, but they will be over the next couple of years, three years. Um, in earnest. So there's the NEVI funds that are happening there. There's other discretionary grant opportunities that we applied for and we're not successful in getting, but hoping we just had round two, hoping to get that. We thought we had a great application <laughs> the first time. We modified it to make it better the second time, um, anticipate, um, hope that we will get that round. So um, definitely some federal funds there, but um, I'm not exactly sure where we are. Bronwood could speak to the state funds that we have for that. And, and we're, like I said, cl in close coordination and how we can use the federal dollars to support the goals of where the state dollars have been going with community and um, multi-unit dwellings and um, workplace charging. So there's definitely some overlap and we're trying to um, help the state funding diminishment <laughs> Um, so there certainly are calculations that we can do with how many vehicles we have and how much charging we need and where we're at. Um, like I said, I don't think that's written down anywhere as of yet, but. You certainly know where you want the fast charging to go, you know, the interstate corridors in the yeah, U.S. We have those, we have the NEVI plan, the corridor um, locations mapped out and that's what's going out to contract in the next month. So um, over the next year, we should see a lot more fast charging out there, um, but yeah. It's the level twos that become more uh, difficult to predict and they're often, they're frequently done privately. I mean, Act 250 now is requiring them in projects, which is something that, you know, that's adding, that's adding a certain number of them. I see them all over the place that I have a feeling are Act 250 related. So the, the state, and, and then growth centers and downtowns is a priority for ACCD. Mm -hmm. There's there's a there's a lot and Drive Electric Vermont's done a lot too, right? On this issue. Yep. yep. I mean they they a had a plan stuff out there before we were required to have the plan. They were the keeper of the plan. So yeah. now we coordinate with them, of course, to yeah. to roll that out. Um okay, thank thank you. Uh, I it I bring it up because it seems like a a topic that ought to be touched on in the climate plan and we can report progress um, and we can report on a gap if we think there's a, there a gap remains but I'm, I'm asking the committee to take a look at it good um thermal 
Be ready to Great. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, just a quick question for either or both of the co-chairs. How much time do we have to spend on thermal, just so I can gauge how we're going to use the time? Well, let me um, pause and ask the members of the public who are with us right now how they would like to proceed. We have on the agenda at 1245 that we would hear from members of the public if they wish to address the committee. And if you want to do that now, we should take those comments. On the other hand, if you would rather wait, um, if you do want to make comments, wait and hear the report from the thermal task group, that's an option too. So let me just ask, are there members of the public who would like to address the committee at this point? Uh, and hearing none, I think, Christine, you should go ahead. And we were planning 15 minutes for this. Um, I realize we're off schedule, but it might be that we can make up that time later. 15 minutes for the thermal portion or 15 yes. minutes for the whole thing? Okay. All right. Great. Good. Great. Um, and we do have a PowerPoint, which I think Melissa is going to pull up and... Um, some of this will be familiar and some of it will be new because we have um, have been meeting regularly over the last three months. We had meeting 10, I believe it was earlier this week. Um, so just uh, next slide, please, just by way of um, grounding us, the thermal sector, which basically is a fancy geek word for buildings, um, accounts for about 36% of Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions. So it's super important. Um, our work, is really focused on strategies for reducing fossil fuel use used for space and water heating um, and the mechanisms for doing that. The fixes are increased energy efficiency, increased weatherization and beneficial electrification. So that's our work together as a task group has been focused on um, building from what we knew and what was recommended in the initial cap based on our best professional judgment today of where things are working well and where there's still lots of opportunity for enhancements, what are the most important policy, regulatory, and or program design implementation strategy, pathway strategies and actions that are needed next to continue and much more rapidly transform the thermal sector market um, and continue to stimulate increased public and especially private investment in energy efficiency, weatherization, and beneficial electrification. We've had, uh, we are very fortunate this time to have a, um, a top shelf team of seven members of the thermal task group, each coming from um, important and different areas of expertise in this sector, and very fortunate then when schedules allow both the um, cross-sector co-chairs um, engage in our meetings when they can. Next slide, please. As we've talked about before, um, we started with the same definitions of pathway strategies and actions that were used in the initial cap. And our group is now well beyond the, the forming and norming stage. And I would say we're now really at the storming stage. And we've been having some very thoughtful, deliberate and mindful discussions about how to move the market and where it's stuck and which levers to push moving forward and to emphasize in the cap. Uh, next slide, please. As we did at our last presentation for you, we have continued to find that thinking about this broad sector, um, first thinking about the buildings and what needs to continue to happen to the buildings to reduce fossil fuel um, use then the equipment in the buildings, then the fuels in the, in the, used in the equipment, and then other cross-cutting issues, some of which have almost already been touched on today. I'm going to speak very quickly on the building side. Dave is then going to speak on the equipment side. Jared is going to speak on the fuels and cross-cutting side, and then I'll do a little bit of wrap-up at the end. Next slide, please. Overall, we have continue to have the same two or 
updated versions of the pathways and some of the strategies that were in the initial cap. And in addition, we're going deeper and broader, as we all know more now, and, um, and we've got the time and the bandwidth. Um, so we have a, a larger number of pathways, a larger number of strategies, and a larger number of potential actions. We're prepared today to share with you the pathways and strategies, um, not all of which we've completed, despite working together very collaboratively for 10 meetings. We're really focusing on exact wording and exactly what it is we're trying, what we mean in each of these elements. So it's it takes time. Um, we talked a fair amount about the first pathway um, last time, which is basically about reducing greenhouse gas emissions in buildings through weatherization and energy efficiency. And just as there was in the initial cap, um, there's still gonna need to be a, a major focus on scaling up weatherization projects in Vermont, especially um, for low to moderate income households who really um, have demonstrated the inability and um, understandably so to participate in market rate um, uh, energy efficiency programs like Home Performance with Energy Star. So while that program is doing well and serving people, we need more, better, different to continue um, to ensure we address energy burden and equity issues in the thermal sector for low and moderate income households. Um, in addition, we want to make sure that the new stuff that's being built um, is um, being built to ideally the best in class building energy codes moving forward. And there's a fair amount of daylight between Vermont's current building energy standards as they're being implemented and as they are, or in many cases are not being enforced for compliance uh, moving forward. So we uh, continue to have a strategy about that and a whole host of actions. We've been very fortunate to benefit from ideas and suggestions to help inform our thinking coming from the weatherization at scale, formerly known as Network Action Team, which I believe now call themselves the Weatherization at Scale Coalition. And they are, have a team of weatherization experts from many, many different public and private sector organizations who've now been collaborating for years on thinking about how to ramp up weather. We know the modeling for uh, the initial cap was um, based on weatherizing 120,000 homes. We know that through 2023, all of the activities in Vermont combined over all time have weatherized just over 39,000 homes. So there's a delta of just, I'm, I'm using very round numbers, even though I know you all are really data driven, just to keep this simple and high level. But um, so there's a delta of more than 80,000 homes yet to be weatherized over the six remaining years between the end of 23, which is when we have the latest data, and the end of 29, in order to meet the 2030 goal. Um, we're currently, collectively, through the hard work and brilliance of tons of different organizations and agencies, um, weatherizing between never fewer than 2,000 homes a year and never more yet than 3,000 homes a year. So to, to knock off 80,000 over the next six years, we would have to substantially ramp up to an average of about between 11 and 12,000 homes a year. So, um, and we know from an equity perspective, there's about 105,000 households in Vermont who are income eligible um, for the weatherization assistance program, which has a generous income, uh, more generous income threshold, higher income threshold as a ceiling than the US Department of Energy. So it's uh, technically homes with incomes of about 57 to $63,000 a year are in Vermont, are, depending on the exact location of the home, are eligible for weatherization assistance program monies. And there's 105,000 of those. To date, um, an estimated 25 to 30,000 of those have, have received weatherization assistance. So there's a lot of daylight from an equity perspective too, from what's been achieved so far to what we would ideally like to achieve um, for those households most in need. Um, so with that, that's where we are on buildings and update on that. And we will now move on to equipment. 
used in the buildings. Right, thank you. Um, good afternoon, folks. I'm glad to be here. I'm going to be looking at two pathways, as Christine just mentioned, that focus on equipment. Pathway two, it focuses on emissions-based standards for thermal equipment. As you can see, the three strategies set out there uh, do just this. Strategy one is uh, a recommendation to adopt a greenhouse standard for thermal equipment stalled in Vermont. Strategy two um, is a recommendation to adopt a NOx emissions performance standard for such equipment. And strategy three would be to adopt standards that ensure the use of lower global warming potential refrigerants in heat pumps that are sold in Vermont. We've agreed on these um, on these strategies and our actions sort of tease this out in more detail. I won't go into that detail here. Next slide, please, Melissa. Pathway three focuses on promoting beneficial electrification and um, it focuses on ensuring that all Vermonters derive the benefits of beneficial electrification. So there's an emphasis on equity. We think that's very important. So strategy one under pathway three, uh, encourage heat pump adoption as a replacement for fossil fuel heating and ensure equitable access to those heat pumps. Strategy two, transition water heater market in Vermont to manageable water heaters. There is a lot of technical discussion going on across the country as to how to do that precisely. If it had been three or four years ago, it would have been simply, um, man the cheapest way to do this would be to manufacture an addressability function in a water heater that when it gets installed in one's home, it can uh, shake hands, so to speak, with a Wi-Fi in your home and that a utility can control it. Now it's not clear if that's the lowest cost way. So the recommendation here is to ensure that um, the performance standard recognizes that there may be a technical solution or uh, an open source solution. But the idea with a performance standard is to be flexible enough to accommodate what the best way is to, um, to do that. So that's strategy to transition water he heater market to manageable water heaters. The second step or the other footfall, when you have to do that, you want to ensure that utilities have programs that are in place to manage that demand. And so this strategy says encourage integration of water heater load and utility programs uh, to do just that. So those are the, the six uh, equipment related strategies um, in brief. I'm happy to uh, try to answer any questions you all have, but um, with that, I'll hand it off to, um, I think, to Jared. Thanks, Dave. Um, so as we discussed before, the fourth pathway is around fuels. And I, and I should note that we've been going chronologically as a task group. So we've spent the vast majority of our time on the pathways and strategies for pathway one, two, and three. So these are largely pathway four is a, a carry forward. It wasn't pathway four in the first climate action plan, but this language and this strategy are from the initial climate action plan. And then the cross cutting ones are, are new, but we haven't dug into them as much as we have some of the uh, other pieces that you've heard previously. Um, so for pathway four, in terms of reducing emissions from greenhouse gas emissions from fuels, the primary strategy that was in the first cap and that we are suggesting would continue forward is, is the implementation of a clean heat standard. I should note that the clean heat standard, at least as envisioned by the Affordable Heat Act, is technology or measure neutral. So the way that you would get emissions reduction could be through different fuels, it could be through different equipment, and it could be through weatherization and building improvements. So kind of it, it really is a larger strategy that's not just about the fuels, but in terms of the way that the emissions reductions would be measured, it would be from reduced fuel use. 
you know, regardless of whether it's a change in fuels, change in equipment, or uh, improvements in uh, weatherization and building efficiency. So that's why that's primarily housed under this pathway. A um, lot of cross-cutting discussion around um, supporting our existing and expanding our workforce um, to uh, meet the, you know, uh, there's a lot of weatherization and equipment installation to be done to reduce pollution and reduce costs. Um, so that's primarily what Pathway 5 is about in terms of recruiting, training, and retaining both the workers and supporting the businesses that employ those workers that are both necessary to implement our thermal sector energy transformation. So um, I think it's safe to say that broadly, this is a, a pathway and a strategy that is important, but we have to dig in a little bit more on the specific language and figure out how else we may want to collaborate with others for how and where this shows up. I believe um, Liz has some thinking about broader kind of workforce cross-cutting uh, approach that the council can take that would not just be within cross-sectors uh, recommendations. So we'll need to figure out how to line this up with the kind of, you know, beyond the cross-sector committee, the broader workforce related cross-cutting themes uh, that are envisioned. Um, and then I think, We can go to the next slide. Um, and this is about elevating greenhouse gas emissions reduction requirements and energy equity goals in uh, the regulation of electric gas and energy efficiency utilities. Uh, prime, right now, the primary metrics that are utilized uh, for utility regulation uh, do not include greenhouse gas reduction. And so, um, you know, a lot of these utilities and their regulation um, kind of frameworks uh, were developed a long time ago and um, are a bit anachronistic in, a, in an era and in a time in which it's a, an overriding state um, legal obligation and policy goal is greenhouse gas emissions reduction in addition to some of the other um, goals for that regulation. So um, again, more to be developed there, but you can see kind of our draft language as it stands right now. Thank you, Jared. And then I'm going to do a, a, a wrap up here. Um, as, as we discussed last time, and this is actually the same slide as last time, we're, we're keeping um, a temporary parking lot um, list of issues that we want to go back and consider again and reflect on whether we need to address it in a different way or if we haven't addressed it at all and need to add it once we have finished building out the pathways and strategies and then the actions for those pathways and strategies that we just shared with you. So this is an example of some of the topics that are it's only an example. The list is several pages long um, of topics that we, we want to come back to, but um, we haven't had the time yet. And um, so we just wanted to share with you. And we're, we're all ears for other topics or concepts that you haven't happened to hear us mention yet. They may already be embedded in a proposed strategy, uh, excuse me, action that we haven't yet gone down to that level of detail with you, um, and they, they may not. So that's that's our presentation and our report for today. I'm not sure if you want me to call on people or if Rich, you will be. Uh, <clears throat> thanks everybody. Um, Liz. Yeah, quick one process, one more substance. On process, are we all sharing, like you mentioned, a, a longer list. Um, are we all sharing that sort of, you know, in the next meeting or the one after that with everybody? Like, so process wise, what does that look like for us? And then I can ask the substance question. Does anyone know? Soon? I think it's up to the intention of the task group at this okay. point. Yeah, it'd be helpful to see like on the buildings one, the 
substance question I have might be addressed by just looking at the rest of your list, but um, how has your committee, like looking at those last two that you have there, which I recognize as a topic of legislative discussion kind of separately, um, how have you taken those on as a part of your mandate given that mitigation is our primary task? And which, which are, are the doing? last, which are the, the last two the, you're referring the to? The two on your last slide there that were more consumer uh, affordability oriented, a great topic, obviously, just wondering how you're layering that into your mandate given our committee's mandate on emissions reduction. Um, that's a good question. I don't know that we've thought about it from that perspective yet. Um, and that's, that's, I think, exactly the kind of filter that when we go back through these, we will be asking ourselves. So yeah, we've been very democratic. So anytime a topic comes up, we park it in the parking lot without having screened it already for how relevant it is. Got it. That was really my question on the process. Yeah. So yeah. These aren't yeah. like a done list. They're just sort of an example of in process. Okay. Yeah. And especially during the forming stage of our committee, you know, some of us had been through this process before and kind of already knew what level of planning and area of thought to be thinking about. Yeah. And some of us were still getting centered in that this is a missions driven work with an equity and justice component. So um, right. screen to be done later, I guess would be the answer. And, and feel free, uh, Jared, Adam or Dave, if you have a different response or more to say. Uh, for me, you just, you, you captured it. There's an equity rubric um, and there's a, a propensity in a bunch of us for trying to do things least cost, get the lowest cost tons that, that, that's sort of intertwined in all our work. So that's, that's why those things come up. And Andrea. Yeah, I just, um, for the clean heat standard one that you had on that last slide too, I just wanted to remind folks that um, the transportation greenhouse gas study that's going on is looking at transportation fuels, it's looking at all fuels, and it's looking at an economy wide. So um, for what that's worth. Can, can you remind us, um, since you brought it up, Andrea, um, the ETA for that first draft report at this point? Yeah, the, um, the scope of work, um, the requirement for the consultant is to get the analysis done by the end of the calendar year, and that will be a draft. Um, and then we'll take more comment on it at that point and refine it and finalize it, but really want to have that draft done by the end of the year so that we can pass it on to the treasurer's office and they can do what they're required to do by the T-bill and make a recommendation. Thank you. Their recommendation is due by February 15th. Melissa. Yeah, just quickly, I'm wondering, um, does the Buildings and Thermal Task Group uh, anticipate making recommendations around funding sources, um, or is that funding source assumed to be the clean heat standard, and have you guys talked about funding at all for the, to accompany the recommendations? I would say yes, yes, and yes. Okay, so essentially, I mean, my second, well, yeah, I don't want to get too far into it, but um, would we couch some of these recommendations potentially as a plan B if clean heat standard does not go forward versus whether it does? But do we have a backup funding source? We we haven't had that discussion yet because we haven't we haven't flushed out that that pathway and the strategies with it. But we have note to self highlighted in yellow. We need to come up with a plan B to suggest in case that in case the clean heat standard does not prevail. Great, thanks. Yeah. You know, with, with respect to, to appliance standards, I, I would say that obviously there are administrative costs associated with uh, formulating those, adopting them, working with neighboring states, if that's the approach folks decide to take. Um, but the, the funding standard, uh, the, the funding concerns, I think, would be less applicable to those adopting those than they would to some of the other pieces. Yeah, agreed. There's some that need big funding, right? Weatherization and then some codes, you know, enforcement, some funding, but probably um, a lower magnitude. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Just wanted to flag it. Gina? Uh, I just wanted to add that Andrea mentioned it earlier. There are public meetings coming up on the cap and trade um, fuel standard uh, for transportation um, 
uh, research. So I think it's very imperative that the this group be informed of when those meetings are and participate to hear what's going on with the study and public reaction to it. Uh, that's a question for Andrea, I think. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I meant to ask it when she was speaking <laughs> before. But yes, just the keep question being know. specifically if this group will be invited to the yes, stakeholder can we, Well, can we know if there are public meetings? It's one way of us getting definitely. the information about the study short of your consultants coming to this group to mm -hmm. bring when, you know, I, I, I guess if, if there aren't public meetings, uh, then having your consultants come to the group when they're at a logical point in the process and yeah. briefing us, I think, would be critical. Yeah, yes, definitely we'll be kept um, abreast of when the public meetings are. Um, like I said, the, the first one is going to be October 3rd, and that, but that is going to be very high level. Yep. <laughs> Um, just sort of an introduction and um, sort of baseline of what cap and invest is and sort of why we're doing it, where we're at sort of thing. Um, and then the technical analysis is going to be occurring. We'll be having some stakeholder group meetings um, and then coming to this group when we have some level of analysis for you to react to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That That's very helpful. Thank you. So I have one observation and one question uh, for the for this test group. the The observation is that I think it's really important to to uh, link the various policies to the workforce um, development need and objective. And in in particular, and and I think you alluded to this, Jared but I want to really emphasize the point that it has proven in other contexts to be really difficult to develop workforce and to develop the businesses who would employ people who need to know if there's a career path in the sector, unless there are public policies in place that make it clear that there's going to be a future business to do this work. And that's one of the lessons of a renewable portfolio standard, for example, developing the workforce for, for solar and wind. And the same thing is true for buildings. You know, we can train all, we can recruit and train all the people we think, or we can try to recruit and train people. But if there's not a performance standard of some kind that is going to in deliver the message that there's a career path here and there's a there's a place to build a business, uh, the workforce development isn't going to happen. So I just think we need to connect the dots there and tell people that these things go hand in hand. Amen. Uh, that's the, the message. And we can say that in, you know, in talking about these uh, policies. The second is a question, and that is, uh, previously, there was some discussion in the codes and standards arena of a particular standard or an early action item regarding rental properties. Is is that something that, that you all anticipate identifying? Yes, it hasn't. We haven't gotten to that yet. And it's a good note that we should remember not to lose track of that. And I'm sure we won't. Okay, guys, yeah, so the, the difference is, you know, instead of just assuming that codes will only apply to new construction in the existence, you know, of a, a rental property code for major landlords, uh, that could, uh, address the needs of tenants in existing units. Yes. Um, yes. Thanks. Um, we've reached a point in our agenda again when we said we would hear from the public if members of the public wish to address the committee. So I want to pause and ask if there are any members of the public who would like to speak at this point.
Uh, hearing none, we can continue uh, with our uh, our next items. And I think Melissa, you can tee these up. Sure. Yeah, I think we have. Um, oh, good. Sophie is on. Oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. No. Um, Andrea, you were going to speak briefly to uh, the the overlap between the rural resilience and um, some of the pathways that are coming out of that group, along with the task groups on our committee. Yeah, and I can do that really quickly. Um, let me just, I have just one slide to share. Are you, are you seeing that one slide? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So really quickly, thanks. I just wanted to sort of introduce this topic. We talked about it before um, at the steering committee or different meetings, really at a high level. We're still at a high level, but now that we're digging in um, to decide what we're going to do about all these pathway strategies and actions, um, I just wanted to introduce this to the group. And um, we are in rural resilience a little bit more in a forming, norming stage, I would say, um, because we have a lot of, we have new leadership and we have new, a lot of new members. So uh, we have broken up into task groups. We have a public health task group. We have community capacity and planning task group, and we have an infrastructure and the built environment. And so uh, one of the pathways that we have, um, I've listed it out here is pathway 16, and it's about reduction of fossil fuel, fuel use. And when I came into the um, subcommittee, I was kind of like, don't really understand why this is here. Clearly, this should be in um, cross-sector mitigation. But, you know, I've dug in a little bit deeper and, and do understand. Um, one of the things um, is because of what I have there in the lower left-hand corner, the Global Warming Solutions Act and the requirement for rural resilience specifically to look at fuel consumption and reduction. So that's why it was included. Um, and there definitely is a different lens that we're looking at that through. So, um, but nonetheless, I think there's some overlap and some opportunity to just, you know, it's not to say we want to hand this over to cross-sector mitigation, but for the two groups to coordinate and collaborate and figure out if there is overlap or if there is a different way that things should be stated to sort of draw out the differences between mitigation and adaptation in this space. And so, um, what I've talked it over with the co-chairs and what we're hoping is that um, we can have a lead from both subcommittees. Um, right now, we were thinking that would be buildings uh, from cross-sector and community capacity from rural resilience, um, although the topic still um, bleeds over into the other task groups of both the subcommittees also. So I think there's some room for even bringing in some other members from other different task groups to to work on this, but really it's just sort of an ask to um, to look at this amongst the subcommittees and see where we can consolidate or revise in a way that isn't um, doesn't create redundancy. And that might be, you know, rural resilience, having a section in our narrative that explains how this is important, but it's different. We may still have some strategies, pathways and actions that relate to it, but Again, just kind of looking at the overlap. Um, and, you know, these are the pathways, of course, cross sector mitigation. I'm not even sure if I included all of them of, that were originally in there, um, and they've changed now. So, well, you know, can look at the new revised ones. But um, yeah, I just wanted to bring it up and see if that is um, a welcomed opportunity by this subcommittee to collaborate with rural resilience on this. Questions or comments on that? <clears throat> Liz? At the risk of broadening, um, I would put on the table a potential area of collaboration that our electric subcommittee will be looking at, you know, kind of the infrastructure and, and you know, hardening of the grid, as some people sometimes uh, say it, for mm -hmm. purposes of making sure the grid can support you know, all of the good customer programs and utility load management programs, among other things. Right. Um, anyway, I know that rural resiliency with your built environment subgroup probably will be touching on that. So it might just yep. be flagging that as another potential collaboration. Yep, definitely. I agree. Great. Thank you.
Great, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Um, I should put my hand up, but to speak. I'm gonna put my rural community hat on now. I mean, I think this stuff is hugely important, but it's it's somewhat random. And how do we institutionalize this idea of rural mitigation? I mean, transportation too could be could be part of this. And why are we just looking at institutions? And I, I guess I don't want to get into rural resilience and where they're going, but if we're going to share the load, hmm. should we be sharing the load on mitigation steps for rural communities? Isn't that part of our charge with equity? And it's something that bugs me from time to time. There's so much focus on on inner 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 cities and downtown areas, and what about rural communities, and how they can mitigate their emissions in a in a fair way? Yeah, you know, I I don't know I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if if CSM takes it on in a more proactive way, or well, I think um I think this is a good start for this sort of more obvious um more obvious um, pathway crossover. But, you know, I think a lot of what you were just saying also gets into the public health aspects of resilience. And so there's there's definitely gonna be a need for, you know, once we have what we think are our, our draft pathway strategies and actions for each subcommittee to get together, there's gonna be a lot of overlap for rural resilience and ag and eco. So there's just, um, you know, how can we coordinate? And I think we, we need to do that um, just especially in the the goal of having a prioritized list from the climate action plan that sort of top 10 i think that's going to be a real challenge and we we're going to need to coordinate amongst subcommittees to make sure that we're all in agreement of what should go forward for the climate council to consider so yeah there's a lot of work a lot of cross-cutting stuff to do Yeah, Christine. Um, my quick read of the three rural resilience actions or whatever they were called that were just on the screen, mm -hmm. um, I, th I compared to my, my guess of once thermal sector has a complete set of suggested pathway strategies and actions for consideration by cross sector that 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 what comes from thermal to cross sector will at least will certainly achieve in some way individually or collectively the the top and the bottom of the three the one in the middle that was about data gathering yeah tools and resources data yep i mean tools and resources generally i think you could argue yes by ver you know, if our recommendations are implemented and the programs are developed, et cetera, we would be expanding. Yeah. The data part, I think, maybe implicitly, but not explicitly. So that's my, so I would, that's my initial response based on yeah. that very helpful comparison of having two side by each, because I had never done that. Yeah. and. Um... What I provided to you earlier, um, an hour before this meeting, <laughs> is uh, oh. more detail on the um, actions that relate to both of those two. So um, you can kind of even look a little deeper into what the actions are that that are overlapping as well. Yeah, I, I've not, I, I haven't seen that. And yeah. um, we would need to come up with an, somebody from cross sector and or from the subset of the cross sector that's in the thermal task group. Some of the members of the thermal task group are non cross sector, which I think is a good thing, but um, cause it's broader. Um, I, I don't wanna be assumed to be the person doing that cross fertilization is my main point. Um, yes, if we're it looking was, there was, that was the request. And if you, you know, that's the request. If you don't wanna do it or you feel like somebody else can step up and do it, then that's great too, but. Um, I'm happy to deliver the request to the thermal sector task group. I'm not going to offer myself as the answer to that request. Sounds great. 
I'd be happy to help you out with some of that. I wasn't quite sure. I, I looked at those three items and um, I, I think it was the first one. It looked like, well, is, isn't that, doesn't the department develop a, a study that tells us how fuels are being used around the state and our subgroup would be less, in, you know, less suited to, to doing that. I apologize. It's just a quick glance, but I, I'm happy to, to, um, to talk with you more about it. Yeah. And it's not, a, you know, there's no pre, you know, predetermined way that this is going to go. It's really just to say, like, should we be talking about this? Is there a crossover? Is there not? Like, what's the differences and and how do we modify them to draw out those differences and make sure the actions are um, relative to both of those? So, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. I'm going to move us along just being cognizant of the time, but um, thank you for flagging the overlap and for kind of taking this first cut at a crosswalk. And again, uh, the intent here was just to have the preliminary dis discussion and um, let the task groups know that rural resilience might be reaching out to a subset of your membership, um, again, to make sure those recommendations are aligned across subcommittees. Um, moving on to our next agenda item, as, as we kind of touched on at, at our last meeting, um, under cross sectors purview is also the approach to um, emissions reductions from non-energy sources. Um, Climate Action Office volunteered to kind of take the lead on um, on this piece and then bring it back to cross sector for discussion. So um, Liz is here today and going to talk to us quickly about um, non-energy emissions. Uh, yeah, I think the the couple updates um, is that I my understanding is that there was some of the non-energy pathways are already being handled from someone in cross-sector mitigation and I forget who it was but I'm going to be connecting with I think Colin had connected with Brian about that so we're going to be looking into that to make sure we're not replicating any work um, and then separately we're um, going to be meeting um, uh, about we're working on waste next week um, with Josh from state government To explore our next up there, but that's that's the, the latest on on energy. So most you're muted. Any questions for Liz? If not, we can uh, come back and get another update um, at our next meeting in a month and. Um, Great. Well, I, I I have a quick question. I I assume from what you just said, Liz, that you're that Brian would be taking the lead for the Climate Action Office on this topic. Is that correct, or is that not correct? Oh yeah. Um. So, uh, Colin and I are going to be working on non-energy. Colin and yeah. and you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, next up, I think we have Sophie on um, to talk about expectations around uh, public engagement coming out of the subcommittees um, in the next couple months. Great, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to share an overview of what's coming up in October and um, then take questions. I'm sure there will be some. Um, so the Climate Action Office is here to support you all in holding some virtual stakeholder meetings in October. Um, the goal is to receive meaningful input from implementers, impacted people and entities and interested parties in a way that can inform the development of your recommendations. Um, so I'll share a few key details about that. And um, most I'm not sure if, if you'll like send out an email later on with this written, but um, happy to help like distribute information if that's helpful. Um, and this has been sent to the co-chairs. Um, so the meeting is going to be virtual. Each subcommittee gets two stakeholder meetings that will be facilitated by the Consensus Building Institute, um, and the Climate Action Office will support um, you know, developing those meetings, planning them, and getting people's attendance, um, et cetera. Um, so, that, so in total, that's six. So it's Two, sorry, two per drafting subcommittee. So it's cross sector, rural resilience, um, ag and eco. Um, in addition to those six, there are going to be 
two municipal focused stakeholder groups, and those are going to be um, organized in collaboration with RPCs, and the Climate Action Office will also support those. We're not talking about those ones just yet, but keep that in mind that there will be like a separate one that's really focused on municipalities and that will be cross cutting issues so that will touch on a range of things. So right now we're just focused on those six. Um, the meetings will be 90 minutes um, and I'll flag for you that there will be more engagement in the spring and at that point there will also be in-person engagement opportunities in the spring of 2025. Um, and subcommittee members are eligible for per diem when they attend, assuming there is quorum at the meeting. Um, so in order for us to do what we need to do to plan these meetings and make sure we get the right people there um, and ask the right questions, um, um, we need a couple things from subcommittees. Um, it's up to you to determine how you want to get these things together for us, but here's what they are. Um, so kind of in tandem, there's two things that are that we'd love to have from you by the 20th, which I believe is next Friday. Yes, yeah, next Friday. Um, so one is defining your stakeholder group, which kind of aligns with your focus area for each of those two meetings. Um, you should note that your recommendations do not need to be fully baked. That's not the point of this. Um, it's good that they are not. Um, but based on your task groups and focus areas for new action, um, those two areas for those two focus groups um, should, should be clear. Um, so that's the one, one thing we need by next Friday. The other thing we need by next Friday, and it, it may be just me working directly with the co-chairs, is dates, like just getting some dates on the calendar for those. Um, and then the, the next thing we need, which is due the week after that, so the 20, Friday the 27th, um, is a list of ideas for specific entities that you think should be on the table. Um, and that could be descriptive, such as, um, a county forester or a food bank, or it could be specific, such as Northwood Stewardship Center or Vermont Farm to Plate Network. Those are, the, I know those are not relevant to your subcommittee, but those are the examples I thought of. Um, so those are the things we need from you this month. Um, I will pause for questions. Thanks, Sophie. This might be news, I guess, to the to many of the subcommittee members. So folks are digesting. Um, but um, I had a quick question, and well, Gina, you go ahead because your question might be the same. Will, as mine. will you be sending us a request, or should we look back at the notes? Will each of us get an email from you saying, "Here's what we need," or are yeah, you asking either. for the group for us to, as a group, recommend things, or as an individual? Um, I, I'm going to leave that process up to you all, um, and then I'm, I'm happy to share this, Melissa, directly, unless you wanted to share the email to come from you. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah, so we'll, we'll send something. I'm sorry. I, I, we, got, we got a couple of correspondences from the Climate Action Office recently. One of them had to do with the, the September 20th deadline. Um, so it said to co-chairs, but all subcommittee members were copied on it is my understanding yeah um, if you didn't I don't, if you didn't receive this let me know um, they, they were copied. i didn't yeah i included all the subcommittee members some folks are shaking their heads so so we did get correspondence from the climate action office earlier this week i think coming out of the steering committee meeting on monday about stakeholder meeting planning and i'll make sure that gets to the whole subcommittee um this week as a follow-up to this meeting but we wanted to preface it in the meeting rather than um having folks get that cold. Um, and my question, uh, Sophie, was around, um, so so our subcommittee is, the big task is our subcommittee is on the hook for holding two stakeholder meetings related to the recommendations coming out of cross-sector. Um, the public meetings that are associated with the transportation cap and invest study, um, are those potentially essentially eligible if we were to have a transportation focused meeting or would we be looking at additional meetings? I 
I guess I'm not sure if you're asking, like, does that count as checking off one of the boxes? Or are you saying, like, do you want to talk about that again at your stakeholder meeting? The, I was asking the former, like, does that count? Or would we really be looking at two additional meetings? Two additional. Okay. Um, so I think the task, I think one of the tasks for this group is kind of what are the focus areas that we want to cover in these two meetings? Do we want to have them sector specific or arrange them some other way? Um, Rich, go ahead. Well, I have a, a, a first a question for the members of the steering committee who are also on this committee. What were you thinking we should do since this is coming from the steering committee? Um, and then I'll just, you know, chime in to say that if you think about it from the point of view of the stakeholders that we would want to be talking to, um, and especially if you consider that other subcommittees of the Climate Council are going to be doing these meetings in the same time frame, the burdens on certain stakeholders might be... <laughs> You know, might really add up if we don't, if we're not strategic about defining the topic areas for these different meetings. So uh, that leads me to suggest that we should, if we're going to go forward in, in this time frame, we should um, make sure to be somewhat targeted and selective in the topic areas so that we get the right people there and we don't overwhelm the folks who who uh, might otherwise be called on repeatedly. Agreed, right? We're talking about a lot of meetings in a compressed time. So um, I guess understanding what the other subcommittees are doing would be helpful and, and being targeted in our outreach and our set of stakeholders. Um, I, I think Gina was next and then Joey. Um, so stakeholders for transportation, that could be everyone who drives a car to people who import and sell gasoline to transit operators. What, what are we talking about what's the goal here is it true stakeholders well everyone's a stakeholder is it someone who will be affected by a policy action i'm having a hard time wrapping my head around and i i just i haven't checked my partner email and maybe that's where this request landed it's not my my usual email um okay. what, um, what i can take a take a stab at that thank you yeah yeah, so I, th I think, Gina, that can depend based on, like, the recommendations that you're considering and your focus areas, like, what's going to be the most valuable to you? And I think that it's okay for it to be a range, you know, somebody who drives a car and somebody who imports fuel. Um, and um, I, I mean, the kind of broad definition that I wrote up was, was implementers. So people or entities who might be implementing things you're thinking about. Um, people or entities who are impacted by the recommendations, focus areas you're thinking about. Um, and then interested parties kind of as a broad third category. Um, so there's definitely some like leeway here and flexibility. Um, it's definitely not prescriptive. Um, and so I just encourage you to think about what would be most useful and meaningful, who would be most useful and meaningful for you to hear from. And noting that these will be open to the public. So there will be these targeted invitations to the people slash entities you say, we really want to make sure we have these folks at the table. And we will more broadly let people know about this. Um, so, you know, if one, if one of your stakeholders were like people who drive cars um, in our broader outreach um, to the general public, I'm sure we'll get some people who drive cars showing up, for example. Is that helpful? Yeah. 
Um, thanks, Melissa. Um, maybe I will review more closely what you sent, Sophie, and just want to wrap my head around this a little bit more. But to Rich's point, which I concur with, like, want to just be judicious with people's time, wanting constructive input. And unless, you know, sometimes what I've noticed is, is like, if it's like too broad of a concept, you know, or too, I think we need to be, you know, meeting people where they are, you know, and I, and I want to talk about this in terms of the transportation cap and invest in low carbon fuel standards study. You know, I know, Andrew, you said like high level, but you know, if what we're talking about is a regulatory program that is designed to do certain things and then also raise revenue, um, you know, when we went through this before the carbon reduction strategy, we were asking about these types of programs and pe people want like on the ground services. They want more transit. They want micro transit. They want bike and bed. They didn't like a cap and invest program, but those that's the very thing that actually will raise the revenue to fund the very things that they want. I just think we need to be very judicious about clear with what we're asking of people so that we can get extremely useful feedback from them and not have too high of a level of a conversation that just is sort of circular, which is sort of feels like what it's been a little bit when we're too up here as opposed to bringing these programs and how we design specific programs down to the personal community level. I don't know, I'm, maybe I'm not saying too much, but I, I, I do wanna use this opportunity to hear from people and get constructive feedback and not have it be too squishy. I just want to chime in to say I think there's a difference between public meetings and stakeholder meetings. So um, when you talk about the policy study, there's going to be both. And and the public meeting will be high level at first. The stakeholder meetings will be more detailed. Okay. And just really quickly to that point, if there are questions that you've developed, Sophie, in terms of the public meetings that you think would be useful to ask at this moment. I'm also feeling like as we're developing our recommendations, it's pretty early on. I know folks that were intended to have some sort of draft by December and then the final plan is not due until July. So how are we staggering public comment and building like a foundation to shape recommendations? And go ahead. So the public meetings that Andrew was referring to are specifically about that cap and invest study. For the stakeholder meetings that are about the cap, the climate action plan specifically, sorry, there's a lot of cap words to throw around. Um, we're not having like public meetings for that. The stakeholder meetings are open to the public and the public are welcome, but we're not having that kind of like broad big picture public meeting about kind of where the cap is broadly at this process. So I just wanted to clarify that that's not happening and the um, public meeting that Andrew is talking about is specifically for the cap and invest transportation study. Thanks, Sophie. Um, is that helpful? I'm, I am, oh, so Christine, um, thanks for that distinction between public engagement and stakeholder engagement. It sounds like these are stakeholder focused meetings. I do think it would be helpful if we came out of today's meeting with at least a general idea of, of what our topic areas might be. And then I would expect we'd spend much of our October cross-sector meeting um, planning for, and hopefully with uh, the Climate Action Office and CBI there, um, planning for what kind of questions we wanna ask the public, to your point, Joey, about um, really what's the right level at which to engage. Uh, so Christine, go ahead. Yeah, that that was helpful, what you just said, Melissa. I just be very, I'm, I'm totally supportive of stakeholder engagement. I've been involved in a lot of that over the years. As for right now, as a cross-sector committee member, I don't know what the ask is of me or when it's being asked by just as a member. So I don't expect it to be answered right now, but I just wanna be clear. Um, so further guidance from the co-chairs of what it is that would be useful from us as committee members at some point would be helpful. Maybe I'm alone, but. but no, thanks, Christine. Um, I guess I'll renew my request to Jared and Liz, who are on the steering committee, like, to help us with some guidance. What is the steering committee really expecting us to 
do and deliver? Yeah, I'll start and then hopefully Jared can weigh in. Um, first of all, the steering committee is a conduit for the work that we all do. This was not developed by the steering committee, but was, but was brought to us through Just Transitions and the Climate Action Office as appropriate ne ne next steps for the stakeholder engagement to ensure that this time, you know, unlike last time, I think it was a fair um, self-criticism we all had that we were developing recommendations without, um, you know, cart before the horse sort of thing, um, without getting specific stakeholder feedback um, iteratively, like we have the opportunity to do this time. So just high level, the idea was we had public meetings in, I believe it was June. Um, and while we had to adjust how those occurred to try to develop a way to get better feedback um, as those meetings occurred from the you know first to the second, um, we did do that. We then shared all of that public feedback broadly with the subcommittees and the climate council. Um, we've then taken the summer to start our work in you know, subgroups uh, to revisit the recommendations that we had last time and develop how those should be evolved or even you know, changed altogether for this next climate action plan as we've all been discussing at these last couple of meetings. And then the Just Transition Committee looking at uh, you know, what uh, appropriate process should be and offering some feedback uh, weighed in, um, my understanding is, and. Sophie or Liz could amplify this um, with some ideas on what the fall could look like. And out of that, the Climate Action Office and Just Transitions um, came to us on Monday with broadly this idea that there's enough um, staff support and consultant support for two meetings per committee um, that can occur in hopefully October or early November, therefore in time for our um, finishing up of the draft recommendations that would go to the whole climate council. And that from there, it really was a little bit of an open um, slate or you know, a blank slate for the committees to think through what would be most helpful um, to the work as well as provide the best opportunity for stakeholder engagement. Um, having said that, there were some open questions, I think, among the steering committee members, obviously one of them being just understanding everybody's time. Uh, it was raised that it would be very important to make sure the meetings, if possible, were um, compensated for those uh, members of the committees and council um, who have been seeking per diems. So that's why that issue was addressed. Um, and the other one that came up is just how it would coordinate with the timing of our subgroups. Um, I think for some that are further along, it frankly might be more challenging in some ways because it's so important if we're gonna have these stakeholder meetings to receive that feedback rather than to fall into what happened in at least the first public meeting last time, which was largely presentation, right? Rather than getting feedback. So finding that balance, uh, I think will be difficult. Um, I don't have more to add from the steering committee. We, we approved the next step, which was to uh, go out to the committee uh, co-chairs um, with the plan and offer of the two meetings. Um, I don't think more was done, but I'm gonna look at Jared across my virtual screen if I missed anything. No, I, I think that overview was good. I'm curious to hear, I mean, since I know Sophie was really involved in crafting that recommendation that came to the council, wanna hear from her, or sorry, to the steering committee. Sure thing, yeah, and I think I think I have some extra context that can be helpful. So at this stage, um, what's being asked of you all, um, and it's you know, up to you just how you decide this or divvy up the work, but it's the, um, but it's the uh, figuring, nailing down a date with me, or two dates, because they're two meetings, and the, the broad focus areas, the subject matter for each one by Friday the 20th, so that's one ask or kind of two, but, and then the next one is to get more specific about who, who we want at the table. So right now, those are the clear asks um, and how you make those decisions and divvy up the work, um, I leave to you all. Um, and then I wanted to share a little more context about what, the, what kind of support the Climate Action Office provides so you can understand what we're doing to support you. And I think that will make a little more clear like what this process is gonna be like and what we're taking care of for you versus what we need from you. Um, 
So we will post the meetings on the website, um, social media, and a couple other relevant places. Um, we will take care of sending out those invitations to the people slash entities you want to invite, unless there's some kind of divvying up of that, you know, an invitation makes sense to come from a particular person, that's totally fine, we can work together on that. Um, and we can kind of keep track of the lists and contact information and everything. Um, we will also provide you with a plug and play template for a slide deck presentation. So that will be, um, you know, late September, early October, something you get. And again, you all will need to decide amongst yourself how you want to fill that up, out, how you want to divvy up that work. Um, but we will help make that easy for you. Um, we will work with the Consensus Building Institute and co-chairs, and to the extent you want in a subcommittee meeting, we can come to the subcommittee meeting to help design the discussion portion of the meeting, or if that makes sense, like with a task group, that makes, that's good too. Um, and we will also send a press release announcing a stakeholder meeting. So hopefully that provides a little bit more of a vision of like what's next, um, but for now there's just those like two main apps. Thanks, Sophie. Yeah, I think the timing is really the crunch here. Um, I think the asks make sense, but yeah. it's really just um, getting ourselves aligned to, so we can get you that by next week. Rich, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to make a recommendation that <clears throat> that our two meetings be focused as follows, that one should be on transportation, including electrification aspects of transportation, and the second should be on thermal, including electrification aspects of thermal. And that um, the two test groups meet um, individually to strategize on the information that they would want to deliver to the Climate Action Office. And I'm healthy, happy uh, to you know, be a conduit for that or to participate in the brainstorming. And I'm assuming that Melissa would say the same. So I'm going to volunteer <laughs> to her that, that, you know, we need to, we need to coordinate it at the subcommittee level and to make sure that we are all on the same pitch. So that's my recommendation. But I don't know how we do that. I mean, why next Friday, other than through a, the exchange of emails about the schedule. Yeah, so um, I'm aware of the hands and we're also about to lose our quorum. So um, not sure <laughs> quite how to proceed. Gina and Liz, do you have quick comments? Yeah, I just I just wanna say that we have a lot on our plate right now getting through the, our, our strategies. And this is adding another another layer that seems it's really important, but I, I just, you know, nobody's getting paid, you know, some people are getting paid for this. It's just a lot of work, number one. No, number two, um, what was I gonna say? The second thing is really important. Uh-oh, <laughs> it went out of my head. Oh, I know, it get, this goes back to what, what Joey was saying, is that about, about people being informed coming in to a certain degree, yeah, we wanna get the raw reaction, but letting people know some background it, it's very easily digestible and we played around with this back in the early summer is how do we talk to the public about some of these transportation issues and you know if we had more time we'd work with you guys and come up with and we actually got some drafts out there somewhere of uh how you would engage on electrification for instance and i strongly agree with rich that the focus has to be on electrification for for our transportation session. Yep. Mine was going to be super quick. It was going to be to amend Rich's plan in a friendly way that buildings and thermal on the one hand, transportation makes total sense. The electric sector people should just like for the next week help one group or the other because that's going to be, I think, a, a layering in both meetings for especially the load control and customer facing programs. So that would be my suggestion. And then on public engagement, a thought I had totally just mine not shared with the rest of steering committee or anybody else is that it might be helpful since we're going to have invite lists to have a common 
decision to send those invited participants some material ahead of time. I, the slide deck that Christine, that you shared would be perfect in my opinion anyway, for your group um, and something perhaps shorter so it didn't take as much time to put together, but you know, equivalent level of detail um, for transportation would be fantastic. And that way, hopefully it could be more of a focused session of receiving feedback and questions and discussion of other ideas um, rather than presenting that. So those are my two contributions, volunteering to help on the one hand and offering materials ahead of time as an idea on the other. Thanks, Liz. And I just wanna, I'm gonna ask steering committee and climate action officer, are we allowed to proceed with the meeting without a quorum? I do not wanna run afoul of any climate council procedures and requirements. I believe my, as long as we're not voting, but I mean, we can't vote on anything without a quorum, but we still have a public portal and public participation allowed. I'm sorry, I also have to go, but that matches my understanding. Uh, okay, thank you. So being respectful of people's time, maybe we could wrap within the next two minutes. And Rich, do you want to close and wrap up? I think I think we are definitely at the wrap up uh, point. And I will ask, though, that I see we do have uh, Annette Smith as a member of the public still with us. And uh, just to ask her if she has a comment to make at this time before we adjourn. Okay, then. Um, hearing nothing from Annette at this time, I think we're ready to adjourn. Thanks all for Thank hanging you. in. And there will be an email to follow up. I know there are a lot of loose ends we have to tie in a bow. So thanks all. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody.